Hi, in this video, we want to take a first look at logistic regression. Okay, so when we talk about regular linear regression, simple linear regression, multiple linear regression, that is structured to model a really a continuous real variable. So in particular, we're saying that our residuals are normally distributed, constant variance, and expected value of residuals is equal to zero. And we have uh, zero covariance between observations. Okay, so that is like our distribution assumptions associated with simple linear regression and multiple linear regression. Now, if I wanna be able to do hypothesis tests, uh, anytime I'm using a p-value, I have to have these assumptions to work through, I have to have, uh, normally, I have to have normally distributed aspect. Now, we can relax these assumptions, just have a model uh, that makes sense, but the moment I want a p-value, I have to have a distribution. All right, well, what about the situation where we have a different distribution? All right, so in regular linear regression, we're saying residuals are normally distributed, Gaussian curve. Well, is that every single possible distribution? No, no, it's not. You know, we could have uniform distribution, for example, right? We could have gamma, we could have Poisson, you know, we could, uh, we could have log normal, or maybe we could have a, you know, something like a binary, let's say, let's go with the binary one, because we're gonna be doing binary this time. All right, so let's say that we're interested in the case where the target variable has two levels. All right, and now like I want to model a target variable that has two levels with using predictor variables, uh, regular linear regression isn't going to work, right? So we're gonna need some other way to approach this. Well, logistic regression is one way to model a binary target variable that depends on predictor variables. So what logistic regression does, it treats that two level uh, variable as a Bernoulli random variable. All right. And you know, if you remember Bernoulli random variables, we have success and failures, and success is one, failure is zero, okay? I should have put this zero slash one for success failure, but okay. All right, so what logistic regression does is that it, it doesn't actually model zero ones, it doesn't actually model the probability of one. What it does, it models the log odds of Success. Okay, so what we truly want, we want a model that estimates the probability of success. Well, that ends up being a lot more complicated than you would anticipate. But if I turn it on its head and I say, instead of probability, I'm interested in the odds of success or the logarithm of the odds of success. If, I'm, if I go after the log, odds of success, then that's something that's very juicy that mathematically we can get at. And there's a whole bunch of statistical properties that come out for free for us. So what, anytime that we're doing logistic regression, we are uh, modeling not the probability of success, we're modeling the log odds of success. And when I talk about odds, that's like in, in gambling, when you go to like a horse track or something like that. Uh, I've never been to a horse track or dog track, but people tell me that that's how they represent, uh, you know, the odds of payout. Okay, so we're gonna go through an example. And this is a modified example from the textbook. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna load the data. Now here, just to make things a little bit cleaner, I'm having the digits uh, truncated down to three. So it just rounds off for me on the display. Under the hood, the full digits are there. And here we're going to just get the data. Here's the file path. And I've got a header on there. And I'm going to sort my data by the target variable. And in this data set, I have the proportion of success for each of the particular values. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's visualize this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a scatter plot with the predictor variable and the proportion of success in the data sets, okay? And I'm gonna color it just like I, I always do. And now the 
the predictor variable is the Zagat food rating, and the uh, target variable is the sample proportion for this. And so here, here is the predictor variable values, and here is the percentage, uh, well not percentage, the fraction, the decimal of the times that it, it counts as a success. And we can see that as we go from left to right, it increases. Okay, so now if we didn't know that this was a proportion, we would want to fit a straight line, right? I mean, this looks like, hey, I could fit like a line here. It wouldn't be a great fit, but it, it would be a fit. Um, but why would regression not work? Why would you know standard linear regression not work? Well, if you think about it, if I have like a larger predicted value, then what's going to end up happening is that it's going to go all the way. It's going to, for a larger value. I'll get a prediction bigger than one. Over here, I could get a negative prob probability. Well, does that make sense? No, proportions have to be between zero and one. Probabilities have to be between zero and one, including zero, including one. So that doesn't work. So what we want to do is the punchline is that we're going to build a model that forms an S. It's going to form an S shape here. To the far right, it's going to be super close to one. It'll be just a little bit below. To the far left, it'll be super close to zero, but it'll be just a little bit above, and it's going to form an S curve. And that's how we're going to do it. All right, now, if I'm, using, if I'm working in R, and I'm doing logistic regression, the, the, uh, the function I want to use is GLM with the binomial family. All right, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Well, what's gonna be happening is that I can pass my data into the function three separate ways. Now, you, you don't get full utility with all the different versions of passing the data. The first way is you have uh, a factor or a binary vector or a character vector of success failures. And if it's a factor or a character uh, vector, then the first level is interpreted as a failure, and then the second one is considered a success. So it, it goes alphabetically, or in, in the order of the factor that you have it arranged in. If it's a numerical vector of zeros and ones, it you so either you can have zeros and ones for like observations, or you can have a proportion that will also work. The other way, and this is the way that the textbook author did it, is to have two columns for counts of failures, counts for successes. And you can uh, look at, and you use the counts to figure out how many times the uh, predictor variable is in, uh, th that the, the achieved value of the predictor variable is in the data set. Now, this last version, not all of the features, all of the functionality within R are available for it. So I don't like it. I'm not gonna bother with it. I'm gonna reshape my data. Reshaping your data uh, is something that we haven't really talked about, but it's an important skill for us as uh, you know, data professionals. All right, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna take the gather function from the tidy R package, and we're just gonna reshape things around. We're gonna reformat things so that uh, we have it in a format that R can use more readily. And so what I'm doing, we have our predictor variable, then we have a column that counts the number of times that it's in, and the number, another column that counts the number of times that it's not in. So for a given value of the predictor variable, for each row, there is, it's, there's a number of times that it's in and there's a number of times it's not in. What we're gonna do, we're gonna take like food and in, we're gonna take food and out and stack them like that. Okay, so when I stack them, the number of times that it's in and the number of times that it's out, those are counts, right? So that's gonna be my count column and my record, I'm gonna record whether it's in or out in a column called in uh, Michelin. And if I have counts equal to zero, that means it wasn't achieved, so I go ahead and just throw it out. 
technically I could skip that. And then I convert being into a one and out to a zero. And then I, I resort the data just to make things a little bit easier to interpret. All right, and this is how I end up getting the data. So I can see that when food was 15, it was not in, and that was that happened one time. So there was only one observation that had food equal to 15. If I look down here, there were 13 times where uh, food was 19 and it was out. Here, this is saying that there are five times in the data that food was 19 and it was in. All right, so here, the predictor variable is 19. 13 times it was out, five times it was in. And that's how we interpret this. What we're gonna do, we're gonna use count as the weight in our uh, logistic regression model. All right, so now let's fit the logistic regression model. Okay, previously we were using LM, linear model function, to fit our model. Now we're gonna go GLM. This is a generalized linear model. Okay, now the key thing that's really big difference about this is that the family is binomial. I'm specifying the relationship between uh, the distributions and the link function or the activation function, depending your point of view. In statistics, it's called a link function. In machine learning neural networks, it's called an activation function, I believe. I, or am I have that backwards? Link or activation. All right, now. I'm going to use the count as my weight because that's the number of times that particular uh, manifestation of the numbers were, was achieved. Data is M because that's what I called the reshaped data. And my formula is that being N depends on food. Okay, so let's go ahead and visualize the logistic regression model. So what I'm going to do, remember I told you that this was, this was going to give us an S curve, right? Well, to get this S curve to be the way we want it, I'm gonna go through and I'm going to uh, basically get a new data set. I'm gonna create a data set of values that I wanna look at the model over. So I go from the minimum in the observations to the maximum, put it in a data frame called new data, and I run the predict function. You'll notice that predict operates exactly the same way for LM as it does for GLM. Oh, I need to back up. If you don't specify family, it's going to, GLM will assume that you want regular linear regression. It'll assume a Gaussian distribution. If you put family equal to Gaussian, you'll get the same as LM. If you don't specify the family, you'll get the same as LM, except for a few minor things uh, will be different, but your output will be practically the same. Okay, so when I use the predict function for logistic regression, there are three different things I can get out. All right, so the default predict value will be the log odds. All right, that's, and it's gonna look really weird and you're gonna be like, what is this? Why, why is this way? Well, how do I know? Because I've done that plenty of times myself. You know, when I'm at work and I'm doing logistic regression. Okay, so what we need to do, we need to say that the type of predicted value is the response. In GLM, when I say it's response, that means that the format of the prediction is the same format as my target variable data. So almost always you want the response for the type. I don't know why it's not the default, but um, I mean, it, it makes sense for like high, you know, for hypothesis testing, stuff like that. Um, if you're doing more of a statistics rather than a prediction point of view, it makes sense to look at the log odds, but Honestly, the vast majority of the time, we want a probability when we're doing logistic regression. So we want, we want to skip that noise, type in response. Okay, so I'm gonna visualize the model. Here I'm going to do some box plots, whether it's in and out, and we're gonna have two different boxes. I'm gonna put the S curve onto there and I like to put the rug, I use the rug command to make it so that I can see where my data is. So I'm, we'll, we'll take a look at it in a moment. Okay, so first thing I want you to do, I want you to look at the box plots. All right, here are, here's a box plot of all of 
the predictor variables when it was in, okay? And here I have the box plot for when it was out on the, and it's the box plot of the predictor variable. Okay, if I see a big difference between these two boxes, if, if they're like this, on, they're the same box and they're right on top of each other, I don't really have much of a model, right? But if I see it spread apart, I can see that when I have an extreme value of food, I'm going to have an extreme value for my probabilities. Okay, so here, this is actually not a very strong difference between the two. I honestly, if this is my model, I'm really not feeling it for using food as the only predictor. Why is that? I see that the median line is cut in the box. Here, I see the median line is cutting the box. I don't think that there's much of a difference. Okay. So now, something I can do further to convince myself one way or another what's going on, I can take my observed predictor variable values and I can tack them up here using the rug function. I can kind of see this teeth. Now I use jitter to spread them out. If I don't use jitter, they're gonna be on top of each other. I don't want them on top, so I use jitter to make them look like teeth. And I do the same thing down here. All right, if I look here and visually, I see that the teeth, are like separate, like each, you know, substantially different from each other, then I have more confidence in my model. If I see the teeth are like this, you know, they're, they're looking like this, then I'm like, hey, that's, uh, my model really is not that strong. If I see the teeth looking like that, I have more confidence in my model. So here, if I had to, I would use this model. Honestly, I would like to back out of this. I would not want to bet my job on this model. All right, so now let's go ahead and do model diagnostics. Now the diagnostic plots for uh, logistic regression in R are the same as they are for linear models, but they're a little bit different and they're harder to interpret. Um, now the residuals versus fitted. So here we're taking zero and one minus the probabilities. Or actually, let me back up. This is, yeah, so this is using uh, you know, log odds. figure out the residuals. Here we have our normal QQ plot. Now, you know, a little bit of deviation from the line, but not really, really not gonna worry about it too much. Usually with, with logistic regression, um, all right, so we do see a pattern here, which is kind of troubling. I see this pattern. Um, I have some concerns about it, but most of the time we're not gonna worry about it. Uh, the Cook's distance here, if there's something about these data points that get labeled, if I like know otherwise that, you know, observation 19 had something weird going on, I might go back and either remove it or I might um, impute some values. But usually these plots, we don't get that, we don't pay that close of attention to it, unfortunately, um, just because it's not as clear cut what these are measuring like it is with regular regression. Here we've got Cook's distance and the standardized uh, Pearson residuals. And we have Cook's distance versus leverage. And uh, we can interpret these the same way as with linear regression. Uh, five is kind of large, so I'm kind of worried about nine at this point. All right, so if I wanna do hypothesis testing, so remember, I have to have some particular distribution assumptions. If I use summary, this will do a type of ANOVA for us. And it looks like the intercept is statistically significant. The, uh, the slope of the predictor variable is statistically significant. It gives me AIC, but you'll notice that I don't get an R squared. A lot of the output that I would normally be getting is gone. And you'll notice that we have a different type of residual. It's called a deviance residual. All right, now here for ANOVA, ANOVA looks completely different. Here we've got something like called deviance and you know residual deviance, and we residuals, degrees of freedom, and deviance, like, you know, what is that? It ends up being something related to the chi-squared distribution. All right, so it, it works out that Deviance is like a maximum likelihood way 
of running hypothesis testing. And so we can use a chi-square distribution to evaluate if the model is statistically significant. We do this because we don't have the F distribution. The F distribution, its construction required us to have Gaussian distribution, normal distribution. We don't have that here. All right, so here, if I take the null deviance minus the uh, deviance from the model, I'll get 50.1. And you'll notice that's what I get right there. And if I want to pass this to a chi-squared test or chi-squared distribution, get p-value, I see that is statistically significant. Overshot it. Yeah, so you'll see that this is the same as what I got a moment ago. Now, if I want to take the residual sum of squares, well, we have multiple types of residuals here. I'm taking the Pearson one uh, because it has some nice properties. That, and if I take the Pearson's uh, you know, sum of squares, I get uh, 163. All right, so now let's talk about the different types of residuals now that we've kind of like took a look at the output. All right, so deviance, this is the, the default one. This is 0, 1 minus the, prob the model probability. All right, so this is the one that you should, should start with. And if you're gonna be doing machine learning, this is the one that you will be looking at when you do other types of model structure. So if you don't have like theoretical structure that you're assuming when you're building your model, you're gonna be using just the deviance uh, difference, and that's gonna be your residuals. Now your response, Your uh, response uh, residual is proportion of success minus modeled proportion. Very similar to this, but here, this is uh, worrying about the number of times that the, uh, the uh, predictor value will, the predictor variable values are in the data. Pearson residuals are similar to response residuals, but they adjust for non-constant variance. The working deviance residuals, uh, sorry, working residuals are deviance residuals divided by uh, the model proportion of, of success. So here we're dividing by, when we're talking about Pearson, we're dividing by a square root. When we're doing working, we're dividing by the, uh, the probability itself. Now partial, what this does, this removes a term from the model and gets a new residual to see how things change. And then standardized residuals are just like the standardized residuals in, in linear models, regular linear models, we're, uh, we are making an adjustment, we're rescaling uh, using the hat matrix values. All right, so now let's make a data frame of our residuals. And I, what I'm doing, I'm just going down the line and putting them all into a data frame. So I've got the deviance, response, Pearson, working, partial. And now I'm gonna get the standardized versions for these two. And what I'm gonna to do to get these, I'm gonna take the hat matrix values and I'm going to uh, put them inside a square root and do some division. And that will help uh, you know, standardize what I've got to work with. And here, are the, here is my data frame of residuals. And you can see that overall things are pretty consistent with each other, but they are on different scales. You can see that you know when one's positive, like all of them are positive, when one's negative, they're all negative. Now, Statisticians will say, you know, you only work with, you know, there, well, I've heard statisticians say, never work with the deviance residuals uh, because they don't adjust for the distribution, uh, the non-constant variance, that is to say. Uh, 
I disagree with that because in machine learning, we don't get those assumptions. We don't have the ability to adjust for the variance. So we always just work, almost always work with the deviance residuals. And so my opinion is that you should work with these the most because if you change model structure, then you're using something you're more familiar with. But if you're living in a world where you're only doing like hypothesis testing, I would agree with their sentiment. In, in that situation, I would be working with the uh, Pearson residuals almost exclusively and standardized Pearson residuals. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the summary. And you'll notice that in this situation, my means are not necessarily zero on this. Remember, when I take the residuals on multiple linear regression, regular multiple linear regression, the residuals always add up to zero, therefore the mean is zero. In logistic regression and other forms of generalized linear models, that's not the case. But here we can look and we can see, you know, what's the impact of the adjustment? We can see that negative 3.8 and 4.5 as the extremes for uh, Pearson, you can see that it's it's more standardized. It'll be uh, easier for us to interpret more similar to something like normal. Um, and let's go ahead and visualize our standardized residuals. And remember, when I'm looking at residual plots, I'm basically just looking for no pattern. So I, you know, there's kind of a gap here. Uh, when I'm doing logistic regression, because of like the zeros and ones aspect, it, it's normal to have kind of like a separation on all of these are the ones with zeros, all of these are the ones with one. And that's just kind of part of it. And so yeah, you can see like that separation between the ones that have observed zero and the ones that have observed ones. And well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.